start sir perfect start. Uh, good uh, good evening friends welcome to a combined webinar of indian arthroscopy society along with our uh, arthroscopy society of nagpur i must thank uh, dr mukesh ladda and definitely the president satyajit chaktap of nagpur arthroscopy society to have brought this uh, collaboration between the national society and the uh, city chapter uh, we are proud that uh, we have uh, two of our friends of our country uh, dr robert from san antonio uh, texas from us and uh, our friend dr pancha from thailand joining is an international faculty along with a host of indian faculty including ashish babulkar who everybody of us know plus local faculty of uh, nagpur let me actually put forward uh, uh, the baton to mukesh because let mukesh introduce everything the format of program and uh, mukesh and satyajit from here would uh, take forward the whole program yeah mukesh uh, thank you dr ips but actually dr navid is going to take this procedure further ahead okay perfect so over to navid yeah uh, on behalf of uh, arthroscopy society nagpur and isi uh, welcome you all to this uh, webinar on a sunday evening uh, on shoulder instabilities and uh, i think dr ips has told you about our faculties so without any further delay we uh, start the evening and our first uh, uh, talk is by dr neha godghate she is from uh, nagpur and uh, she is the only female orthopedic surgeon in uh, nagpur practicing arthroscopy her talk is on clinical radiological assessment of shoulder instability so neha let's start with you thank you sir yeah welcome amit he has just joined good evening amit He's just connecting no worries no worries Am I audible now? Yes, you are. And your screen is visible. Yes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, greetings from Nagpur, India. Uh, I am Dr. Neha Gorghate, orthopedic surgeon. I wish to sincerely thank the National Society and Arthroscopy Society of Nagpur for giving me the support to talk about the clinical and radiological aspects of shoulder instability. Yeah, your audio is not proper. Yeah, Amit sir, yeah. thank you. Um, first, uh, first of all, why is this talk important? The arthroscopy stalwarts who will be sharing their knowledge in subsequent talks are at top position today, not only because of their fine surgical skills, but also because of their clever clinical acumen. The decision about selection of patient. of for surgery is accurate based on their clinical findings so to emphasize this let me show you one case uh, a 51 year old gentleman came to with uh, came to me with complaints of difficulty in lifting the left shoulder since 2 months uh, there was no history of trauma when asked he was non diabetic and had undergone coronary artery bypass surgery being a google patient he came up with all the investigations and with a preconceived notion that is a uh, mid substance subscapularis ma uh, minor tear needs a major treatment to my surprise the first clinical sign which i had anticipated to be a central st sternotomy scar was absent this was a minimally invasive open heart surgery where the incision was in left fourth intercostal space there are cases reported of the injury or neuropraxia to long thoracic nerve due to this incision clinically he had mild bringing of left scapula and his subscapularis was grade 5 so after 5 months of reassurance and physiotherapy the patient recovered well and is happy with his progress and now he trusts doctors more than google so uh, aos survey in 2000 showed that 75% of orthopedic surgeons believe that they communicated satisfactorily with their patients however only 21% of the patient thought the same better doctor patient communication is linked to increased patient satisfaction and adherence to the treatment regimen and ultimately improved clinical outcome so the communication with the patient starts with history shoulder problems are very age specific 
uh, if a young lady with uh, complaints of dislocation comes to you, you think of bankers. Vis-a-vis -vis a 70 year old lady comes with a similar complaints of instability. It has to be due to massive rotator cuff tear, specifically massive subscapularis tear. Next comes occupation. If a sports person has instability, post-operatively he has to resume his sporting activities early. So according to it, post-op rehabilitation needs to be stepped up. Hand dominance gives an idea about the affection of patient's activity. If the patient points, uh, points out a posterior shoulder joint pain, that means it gives a fair idea that we are probably dealing with impingement. It is mandatory to fetch information about the cause of first dislocation. If it's traumatic, that means we are dealing with a banker's lesion. And if it's a traumatic, then probably it's bachelor's capsule or labrum may, might be normal unless, and, unless proved otherwise. One can see uh, that this patient has massive translation of humeral head in AP direction. Number of dislocations are important to know the probability of uh, bone loss. History of previous surgery is important for preoperative planning. Posterior shoulder examination can be more informative than anterior, as we can see here. This young boy had a global wasting of shoulder with complaints of shoulder pain since just three months. So uh, he was diagnosed to be a cox shoulder. If there is a single muscle wasting in such a muscular volleyball player, uh, it goes in favor of suprascapular neuropathy. Coming to range of motion, if a passive range is more than active, uh, it suggests muscular dysfunction like uh, rotator cuff pathology or a nerve injury. If shoulder is locked in internal rotation, it suggests posterior dislocation. Uh, there is excessive passive abduction as compared to the opposite side in cases of Hagel lesion. Decreased internal rotation as compared to opposite side uh, is noticed in overhead athletes with internal impingement. Excess range of motion in all the joints is a sign of hyperlaxity. And uh, then you know that you are dealing with a global shoulder laxity. There is increasing appreciation that uh, glenohumeral stability may be influenced by relationship of scapula to thorax. So if there is a scapular dyskinesia, gradually changes occur in shoulder joint. Many patients can be treated early if we detect dyskinesias early. However, these kind of unique cases of muscular dystrophies are difficult to treat. They start quite early in uh, their life, like this 17 years old lad, and they progress over the years. And they also have uh, genetic predisposition that uh, muscular dystrophies run in their families. Sulcus test is elicited by inferiorly directed force applied to the shoulder joint and translate, translation is graded as one, two, and three. Drawers test is best uh, better assessed under anesthesia as the humeral head is manually subluxated in both the direction anterior, anteriorly and posteriorly to know the extent of glide of humeral head over the glenoid. Anterior apprehension is done either in supine or sitting position where the arm is brought into abduction and external rotation and the examiner looks at the face of the patient for any sign of apprehension. Crank and Job's test is, has to be done at last as it is provocative man, uh, maneuver. The patient is relaxed, the shoulder is taken into 90 degrees of ABA position, abduction external rotation position, and pressure on the proximal humerus to relocate the joint. When released, the patient suddenly becomes very apprehensive and there is guarding. In case the test is positive at just 40 degree of abduction, that means uh, there is mid-range instability and we are dealing with a bone loss. Jerk test is performed for posterior instability. After stabilizing the scapula, axial force is applied to the arm in 90 degrees of abduction and internal rotation. And then, and then maintaining the axial force, the arm is brought into adduction. I have abducted and rotated and given the axial force to the humerus. And then 
gradually maintaining the axial force the arm is adducted suddenly uh, a pain with pain is experienced by a patient if there is posterior instability beware of these teenagers who can voluntarily subluxate their shoulder joints the mainstay of treatment is skillful neglect and calf strengthening exercises and most importantly parent counseling so now let's divide the sequel of dislocations likewise obviously a disturbance in structural uh, uh, stabilizing structures and function will consequently lead to unstable joint radiographs provide an overview of bony anatomy orientation and initial assessment of heel sac lesion uh, this picture of anterior inferior dislocation is commonly seen however this x ray though looked innocent a uh, innocent primarily the patient had shoulder locked in internal rotation so uh, it is suggestive of posterior shoulder dislocation there is a light bulb sign and bilateral view clearly denotes the posterior dislocation of the shoulder if looked keenly the bony bank cards can be visualized on x rays striker notch view is useful to assess the heel sac lesion once the shoulder gets dislocated there is separation of capsular lateral complex from the glenoid leading to bankers lesion and undisplaced tear of labrum with intact scapular periosteum is a pervious lesion in mri with abduction external rotation position the accuracy of detecting pervious lesion was significantly better than in neutral position the sensitivity increased from 40% uh, to 74% respectively a classic soft tissue bank guard lesion includes tearing of a labrum with tear of a glenoid periosteum the labrum provides stability by serving the attachments to the glenohumeral ligaments and also by deepening the glenoid cavity however on the other part of spectrum in cases of chronic instability the labrum is detached moved medially and rotated internally and adhered to the glenoid neck with periosteal sleeve which is aversed of the glenoid neck so that comprises of uh, alpsa lesion here in this arthroscopic view viewed from anterior superior portal uh, there is glenoid on the right side and the labrum is displaced medially and adhered to the glenoid neck isolated tears to the superior labrum are not common in anterior dislocations however antero inferior labral tears can extend circumferentially into superior labrum the anterior band of inferior glenohumeral ligament is the most commonly torn portion hagel is humeral aversion of this ligament in this the inferior capsule is aversed from the humeral neck the capsule is very well attached to the glenoid uh, to the glenoid the two bands of ighl are critical in maintaining the hammock in this region the hammock is disturbed hence the joint gets unstable so in this mri there is a fluid extravasation in inferior pouch and there is no capsular demarcation inferiorly this is arthroscopic find where you can see the rent in the inferior capsule the lesions are to be repaired with caution due to danger of injuring the axillary nerve now coming to bone loss uh, due to bony bank uh, bone loss can be uh, both acute or chronic uh, acute will be bony bank cuts and chronic will be attritional bone loss if there is a bone loss due to bony bank cuts both mri and ct are needed to quantitate the size of bony chip in acute cases radiology has got upper hand over clinical assessment bony bank cuts needs to be repaired to avoid chronic instability normal glenoid is pear shaped however in attritional bone loss it becomes inverted generally a thought process is that more the number of dislocations more would be the bone loss however there has been studies showing the weak correlation between dislocation frequency and degree of bone loss clinically if we see if we find there is a uh, apprehension at just 40 degrees of abduction and uh, the test is positive that means we are dealing with a bone loss case the humeral side is known as heel sac lesion and prevalence of heel sacs is 60 to 67% in initial dislocation however it escalates up to 85% in recurrent dislocations the amount of heel sacs is definitely of importance however the location of heel sacs is of utmost importance 
because insect lesion which is small and narrow but located medially on the head needs special attention ito in his article very well demonstrated on track and off track concept of the uh, lesion so uh, now coming to posterior instability excessive renal retroversion is considered as predisposing factor for posterior instability and on mri reverse bank cards is a sign i would like to end my talk with uh, with the uh, favorite quote uh, posted on my alma mater to uh, which says that to study the phenomena of disease without books is to sail an uncharted sea why to study books without patients is not to go to sea at all thank you thanks thanks neha for that wonderful talk it was wonderful uh any questions from anybody yes mukesh do you have any question no no not for neha no i don't have any much question because it was very well elaborated by neha how to clinically evaluate instability case thank you uh, so i think uh, uh, thanks neha youtube thank you. yeah there's nothing on youtube yet so we'll take any questions if they come later on we go to the next talk the next talk is by uh, dr robert hajler uh, i would like to introduce you to him uh, i met dr robert uh, last year when i was visiting dr stephen burkhart and uh, whilst i was in the theater in the adjacent theater dr dr robert had a list of like uh, three reverse uh, shoulder replacements so i was very intrigued and uh, i wanted to meet him and a couple of days later uh, i went and, and met him in the opd learned a lot from him so he's a fantastic guy he's a shoulder and elbow surgeon and uh, dr robert welcome uh, and uh, i thank you for accepting our invitation so uh, his talk is on first time dislocators management options dr robert please please unmute yourself dr rob okay am i on now yeah you are yeah uh very good thank you so much for that kind introduction and for having me today it's a pleasure to be with you and i really am looking forward to learning uh from from everyone there so my talk is on the management options how to approach the first time dislocator uh, and specifically first time anterior shoulder dislocator A uh, few disclosures. Um, I think what's relevant uh, is probably uh, consultant activities and also um, my uh, role with the Arthroscopy Journal as a social media editor and podcaster. I'm going to uh, present a couple of cases just to introduce our topic on first-time dislocation. So this uh, first this first case is a 16-year-old. a high school football player american football who was injured one day prior to presenting in the office he was tackled from behind and sustained an anterior shoulder dislocation uh, that he thought that the shoulder came out the front uh, reduced by the trainer on the field and these were his presenting radiographs you can appreciate a little bit of a hill sacks lesion uh, there on the internal rotation view and that he is um skeletally immature here's an mri of his shoulder that was taken just a few days later you can tell um by the t2 signal there that this was uh done very close after the injury very extensive uh, labral tearing there and you can see that he does have a small hill sacks lesion in the usual location So my recommendation based on his age and desire to continue to play a contact sport uh was surgical stabilization to prevent recurrent instability. Unfortunately, the uh patient's family declined um surgery and um he came back a year later having had a three additional dislocations uh that a couple of them were self reduced but one had to be reduced by an athletic trainer and on radiographs 
very similar appearing, maybe a little bit of progression on the Hill Sachs lesion. And you can see that there's starting to be some sort of change happening at the anterior glenoid margin there on the axillary view. And again, the recommendation was to repeat advanced imaging and for sur surgical stabilization to prevent bone loss, but the patient de declined and was lost to follow up. So I think that's a very common scenario for these types of patients. Another interesting case, this is an uh, older patient, middle aged 56 year old woman. She fell down the stairs and sustained an anterior shoulder dislocation that was reduced by an ER physician. And um, the shoulder had been out for a couple of hours. You can see there on the post reduction film the large Hill Sachs lesion. Radiographs in our office uh, show it looks like the glenoid uh, is intact, and, um, but you can see the large Hill Sachs lesion. MRI scan, uh, similar to the first uh, case, a little bit deeper on the Hill Sachs lesion, a little bit larger lesion there, but uh, the Rob, typical. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. We can see some two small screens on your presentation. Mm, let me see if I can fix that. If How it's about possible. this? Yep. How about this? Is that gone now? Then that's perfect. That's perfect now. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So, um, in this case, because of the patient's older age, I recommended non surgical treatment. So, she had a brief period of immobilization for comfort, went to some physical therapy was able to regain her range of motion and function. However, seven months later, she had a recurrent dislocation, blow drying her hair. So just with the arm in abduction and external rotation, the shoulder dislocated again, and she had to have a reduction in the emergency department. So after that, we decided to proceed with surgical stabilization. So she had a bank cart, arthroscopic bank cart repair and arthroscopic hill sacks with remplissage and has done very well with that. So I think that the questions that are brought up by the first time dislocator, what are the rates of recurrence? What are the risk factors for recurrent instability? How should we work up the first time dislocator? And what are the results of stabilization for these patients? <clears throat> so clearly the, our best knowledge for the natural history of the first time anterior shoulder dislocation comes from Hovelius. And they have done such a wonderful job of following this a series of patients prospectively followed for 25 years and all living patients. Um, this has been, these results have been reported a couple of times, most notably in JBJS 2008, but um, KSSTA, there's another write up of this um, that might be another accessible source. And I think all shoulder surgeons should know this information when they're counseling these types of patients. Um, 25 year radiographs done in almost all of these patients. And the initial purpose of this study was to study immobilization versus um, for three to four work weeks versus non. And um, so, the, so the results of this study, so looking at the immobilization versus non-immobilization, uh, we can see that stratified by age group, there's very little difference between patients that were treated in a sling versus not and there's not really much of a reason to belabor that. Um, that's been shown in other studies as well. But I think what's really important to know about is the natural history. So for older, the older patients in this study, and the oldest ones were up to 40 at the time of enrollment. So patients in their late 20s or 30s uh, had a much higher rate of either no recurrent instability or minimal recurrence that then became stable over time. Whereas the youngest patients had a very high rate of recurrence and going on to surgical stabilization. So at two years, we can see that only at two years and five years, we can see that only about 30% of those young patients remain stable without recurrence and without surgery. And at 25 years, the older patients uh, had high rates of either a solitary event or stabilization over time without surgery, the youngest patients, very high rates of recurrence. And if you said, what is the best outcome? That would be a solitary instability event that never occurred really less in the mid twenties to 30% of the time that happened for the youngest patients. 
So there were some factors associated with recurrence, lower age that we've talked about. Greater tuberosity fracture seems to be protective. Uh, and that happened in the two ends of that cohort, the youngest patients and the patients in, in the 30s with higher frequency, bilateral involvement predisposed to recurrence. They did not find that any bony involvement, which was just on radiographs, uh, was associated with recurrence or activity level or gender. So Dr. Hovelius has written a couple of times that they felt that on the basis of that finding that routine surgery for the first time dislocator would result in many unnecessary operations, considering that some of those shoulders became stable over time. So that's one perspective on the natural history of anterior shoulder instability. This systematic review that was, uh, that was published a few years ago in uh, BJSM reviewed 10 studies uh, with over 1,300 patients with minimum one-year follow-up, so you, this is short-term follow-up, um, estimated that the recurrence rate at one year was 40%. And of course, the risk factors held from Hovelius that younger age was many, many more times likely to have recurrent instability. In this study with more patients, they found that men actually were more likely, again, the greater tuberosity fracture was protective and hyperlaxity was uh, found to be associated with recurrent instability. So I think that that's important to know, and that's an easy uh, physical exam uh, process to go through just to um, establish the Bainton score. And that is a significant risk factor for recurrent instability after, um, after first time anterior shoulder dislocation. So in the discussion of this paper, they say um, that it's, this is a complex scenario, shared decision-making uh, with the patient being involved in that decision-making is appropriate. Uh, another interesting study from Robinson, these are, uh, this is a very well done study with prospective follow-up of first time um, traumatic anterior shoulder dislocations in young patients. And from this, we there was a very high rate of recurrent instability as we've seen before. Most of those that developed it uh, uh, had that happen within the first one to two years after their original injury. One consideration if you're going to treat these patients non-operatively is whether they should be immobilized in external rotation as has been advocated by ETOY. This does in meta-analyses seem to lower the recurrence risk somewhat, 22% versus 35%. So, so lowering that risk by 44%, again, at short-term follow-up. So there's not, to my reading of this, not an enormous benefit and you have to get to these patients early, according to the experts in this technique. They need to have three weeks of immobilization and nearly constant, at least 16 hours a day from the time of injury. Otherwise, those tissues are going to heal in their medialized position. For me, I don't get to see these patients soon enough, typically afterwards, to do this. So what's the big worry after the first time anterior dislocation? For me and the young patient, it's recurrent, a recurrent instability leading to bone loss. In the older patient, it's whether they have a full thickness rotator cuff tear. So for, in my practice, both of those, if I'm able to, I'll get an MRI to work up their injury and find out basically what all of the damage is. We've seen from Brett Owen's study, and this is a really interesting study where they prospectively MRI'd military, uh, a military population and then looked at what happened to shoulders in terms of bone loss based on an initial MRI, which was done at the time of enrollment, and then if they had any instability. And what you can see from that is that even with a first time instability event by MRI, there can be an average of 6.8% glenoid bone loss. And for the recurrent, uh, for these recurrent patients, um, the glenoid bone loss is even higher. So, and we, uh, we know from other studies that this is, that developing bone loss is a big factor in treatment decisions and how these patients ultimately do. We know from arthroscopic studies, these are older studies, but that virtually all patients that have an anterior shoulder dislocation have large capsular labral injuries and Hill Sachs lesions. And it's interesting if you go to the lab and take cadaver specimens, this was a study that we did on remplissage. It's not really the topic of this talk, but if you go to the lab and take a normal shoulder and you try to dislocate it, it's very, it's very difficult to 
create a fully dislocating shoulder. So in this study, we made a posterior capsular split in order to access the back of the humeral head to create our hill Sachs lesion. Then we made an extended bank heart lesion all the way from 12 to six o'clock on the anterior glenoid. If you try to dislocate that shoulder, it will not come out. Then we made an anterior glenoid osteotomy to simulate bone loss, still won't come out. Then you make an, a T split in the anterior capsule. And finally, you can dislocate the shoulder easily. So, and this, and this kind of procedure in the biomechanics lab for creating a shoulder instability model is common across most studies. It's very difficult to create a dislocating shoulder. And when patients have that happen, it's extremely damaging. I think that it's a mistake to just assume that most of these patients have a small bank heart lesion only without any other damage. So for me, when I work up these patients, I think high quality x-rays are very important in scrutinizing those for bone loss. I think MRI is important. Clinically assessing them for hyperlaxity, I think is important. And, and thankfully on the Bainton criteria, you can do that without really assessing their shoulder. And you can look at the opposite shoulder for a sulcus sign. And I think that gives you a good idea. CT, I typically only do for surgical planning. So what are the results of, of surgical stabilization in this situation? Well, we know a lot, I think, now about whether about the outcomes of uh, about, uh, about the outcomes of initial surgery after a first time dislocation enough that this uh, we have a few meta-analyses. So this one is in the pre-proof stage. This is going to come out in the arthroscopy journal uh, in 2020. 10 prospective studies, 569 patients for conservative treatment of the first time dislocation versus arthroscopic bank heart repair. So the recurrence rate for conservative treatment, very high as you might anticipate. With surgery, it lowers that considerably. Subsequent surgery, again, conservatively treated patients have a high risk of going on to subsequent surgery. If you do arthroscopic bank heart repair, there's some risk of recurrent surgery, of revision surgery, but, but much lower. And return to play, uh, you get a benefit from initial surgery as well versus conservative treatment. This is an interesting study. This is long-term follow-up of one of those uh, of one of those studies, uh, which randomized patients to conservative treatment versus arthroscopic uh, bank heart repair. This is an older Caspari technique with transglenoid sutures, but uh, similar results that surgery gives you a, a benefit for recurrent instability. And at shorter term follow-up, these authors found that clinical outcomes with the WOSI score were statistically significant for surgical group versus conservative treatment. A longer term follow-up that started to wash out a little bit, although this may be an underpowering effect. And uh, it seems that that amount of change in WOSI score, if it were statistically significant, would be clinically significant. So I think that that's one thing that we miss sometimes in talking about this issue is that even if the patient that's treated conservatively without surgery for their first time anterior dislocation may not have recurrence, they really may be living guarding their shoulder and not having uh, as good of an outcome as, as, as if it were stabilized. So that's something that needs to be studied in uh, a greater detail in the future. So again, you know, in the discussions of these kinds of studies, we see this type of advice to give the patient information about the natural history and their risks and do shared decision-making. In my practice, I tend to push younger patients a bit to have surgery for this for the first time dislocation. Older patients, because of the information that we have from Hovelius, um, I'll give them more of an option and more freedom to decide against surgery, particularly if, you, if they don't have a full thickness rotator cuff tear. Um, and, uh, but this is one of those, I think, issues that's a lot of the art of medicine and uh, involving patients in the decision-making process. So um, I'm not sure if that provides much clarity. It's, I think there's always going to be, uh, like I said, a bit of art in managing these patients and really trying to get to know them, to get to know their, their needs and what they're planning to do with their activity level and assessing all of the damage that they sustain from their dislocation. But I think we do have a good amount of information to help them and help us understand what's happening and, and whether surgery is a good idea for them. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. That was a very lucid, very extensive uh, study on first-time dislocators. 
do we have any questions from anybody just a question robert uh, i mean uh, i was just wondering uh, definitely younger patients have high recurrence but what is the reason why there is high recurrence i mean healing rate should be higher in a younger individual this tissues would heal much better than an older individual so why exactly are the reasons that it is high well i mean it's i think that it's the highest in young men and you know the way that young men live their lives or they put their shoulder in the at risk i mean and you know we know that Uh, that shoulder instability is primarily an end range phenomenon of their range of motion. So, you know, patients that have had the damage from a dislocation can manage to keep their shoulder in, particularly with good rehab of their rotator cuff, except for at the end range of motion. So just the way that young men live, trying to do sports, trying to do weightlifting, labor, um, they, and, and it depends, I think, on how people sleep also somewhat, uh, but that, I think it's more of an activity issue than their ability to heal. And also just what I said before that, you know, I think it, there's so much damage that happens with not just with a subluxation event, but with a, a true full shoulder dislocation um, that at the end range of motion, there's, there's so much damage that happens that it's difficult to recover from that. Probably that they, their collagen is good, but they, they suffer from a high velocity injury. older individuals have weak collagen and they can dislocate with a low velocity injury so maybe that's a agree case. yeah great that's a great point yep uh, dr yes, rob yes. that was an excellent talk want to ask dr rob as well as all our faculty panelist members here a very interesting study which dr rob mentioned there is 6.8% glenoid bone loss even with first time dislocators so i want to ask do every one of us advise mri or ct scan and assess the glenoid bone loss for first time dislocators dr rob do you do ct mri for all first time dislocators and assess that 6.8 bone loss in every just, first time dislocators yeah just i i do try to get an mri if i can to assess everything i mean mri isn't quite as good obviously as ct at bone and i think in that study they may have had a better ability to detect that because they had a they prospectively had a pre-injury mri so you know it, it's harder on mri but i think it is something to pay attention to dr ips do you yeah, do? we do we do ct scans uh, we have found quite high numbers of bony bank cards even in acute first time dislocation so i think uh, ct scan definitely has a superior investigation if you're looking dr. for a bone issue with it. So first time dislocators, you yeah. always investigate with CT, even if CT you don't yeah, find yeah. anything on X-rays. Yeah, even if not, it's not clear because all of these X-rays usually uh, cannot uh, demonstrate small uh, bone, uh, acute bone bank cards. So CT scans. Doctor Ashish, your so, take on this? Mukesh, uh, good point you picked up there. But how does six point eight percent bone loss change your management? So, so sir, that's I what I wanted to come here. Sir, Robert do that, and myself and others. would continue doing a bank card so i think what is important is uh, let me allude to the hovilla study that robert presented that in the elderly patients hovilla was very clear that if you operate the first time bank card we are operating 50% more patients than necessary but that would appropriate to the younger patients neha presented a very good sign of the mid range instability and if you combine that with the double cortical sign on the true ap x ray then you've got your risk factors and then you know exactly which patient to send for a ct scan i am not so fussed about 6.8% i'm worried about the subcritical bone loss so clinically we'll pick up 20% bone loss very easily because high velocity injury uh, electric shock epileptic we're not going to miss that 6.8% bone loss if i miss that i will still do a bank card and i won't go wrong it will not affect the prognosis of the patient the 12 and 15% bone loss in a contact athlete will be disastrous because it will curtail his recovery and affect the post op results so those are the ones that you should pick up and that will help on the double cortical sign on the mid range instability test that you do clinically on his cause of injury in the first index injury and those are the patient i might choose to put into a ct scan along with that mri 
actually we have a deal with our radiologist that if they feel that there's any significant 10% or more bone loss they will automatically do a ct scan so that when the patient comes in he comes with all the relevant information so if you make the same deal then unlikely that you will miss those so should we give the message here that even if it's a first time traumatic dislocator we should do at least an mr ct and assess the things rather than only no, plain no, no. mri only mri mri has to be done okay because most of us i think most won't do even the mri even after bank first dislocators so dr so banchai okay. you also should because i think we will do, do investigation in the patient that we um that have high risk right like uh, as she said if the patient have high risk or they are working in very dangerous area they are diving they are working like a uh, firefighter something like that I, i try to do investigation because i don't want to have the second episode in this type of patients so i do investigation but the rest of the patient i will not do because i think the mi ct scan is is too much yeah you invest too much uh, i think the special x ray like um i prefer the apical op- oblique view or gut view you can see the amount of bone loss very well okay so i just investigate in the high risk patient yeah that that's my idea okay thank you okay uh, robert we have a question uh, any indication for a lateral j in a first time dislocator that's more unusual for me in my practice um i have treated a couple of patients initially because of a few different issues you know hyper hyperlaxity being one but um yeah i mean in in just my practice is similar to most north american surgeon well i guess most non french surgeons that we try to do soft tissue reconstruction first and um so that would be for me unusual okay and uh, before we go to the next talk uh, neha we have a couple of questions for you uh, how is kim's test different from a jerk test neha neha can you hear me I think we Hello. lost her. Yeah. 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 Neha. Neha has come back. Hello. Yeah, Neha. The question is, how is Kim's test different from a jerk test? Neha, you need to unmute yourself. Can yeah. I answer that on behalf of Neha? Yes, sir. Please. She is just unmuted, so maybe she is online. Neha, do you want to take that? No. okay so uh, the jerk test is done in 90 degrees in a adduction abduction maneuver so you are provoking so whenever you go uh, posteriorly or reducing it when you go anteriorly in internal rotation the head jumps behind the glenoid and comes back in the presence of posterior labral tear i think the sensitivity and specificity of that test is much higher kim's test is to pick up in a supine position you put them into an abduction external rotation and then bring them on there so the jerk test is done in this position at 90 degrees where the skim test is done in supine and we are taking them in here and he's trying to generate the click between the posterior labrum tear and pick up that subtle skim lesion also sometimes but the sensitivity and specificity of that is not so high right uh, uh, another one neha neha another one uh, i he's asking adhesive capsulitis if one can explain so i think what he means is how do you diagnose adhesive capsulitis clinically clinically adhesive capsulitis uh, hello am i audible sir yeah you are yes yes a little more closer to the microphone please uh, clinically in adhesive capsulitis uh, there would be uh, uh, both passive and active range of motion would be affected and uh, if uh, radiologically if we see uh, there would be uh, mri signs which will uh, tell you the uh, there is a adhesive capsulitis clinically basically both active and passive range of motion would be affected 
right can i ask okay. one yeah yes mukesh uh this is to dr ashish sir dr ips and dr bancha we all face almost this situation around 24 25 year old boy recreational player engineering student first time traumatic dislocator he comes and you diagnose and get his mr and thing and there is a bunkart lesion so how you try to tell him what about the recurrence because this is common situation which we face rather than a high level athlete so yeah. how you deal with them in the opd how you say them ki whether you need surgery or you carry on with conservation who first okay sure who first <laughs> is, uh, your Dr. Ashish. Ashish. interpretation yeah but yeah. Uh, i would somebody who's yes yes sir please am i good to talk yeah 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 so somebody who's under 20 i would speak to him and his parents and tell them that in their interest that his recurrence rate being close to 80 90% we should offer him surgery and he should have a good recovery and the recur- recurrence rate is minuscule post surgery uh, if he's not a contact athlete and if his life doesn't depend on that and he's able to do a, a change of lifestyle and he's willing to do that then mm. it's unlikely in our situation he'll come in for surgery till the second third fourth episode and we see that i see that quite often and uh, they will come back eventually uh, somebody yeah. who's between 20 and 30 then i'm not so hard pressed but below 20 i would persevere and convince them with the statistics most of them will go down to google and do their own research and come back to us but i don't have a silver bullet for that to get that patient on the table unfortunately bancha yeah actually the same like ashish um i think we we discussed with the patients about the risk of the lead dislocation because under 20 the risk of dislocation is very high and if the patient is overhead athletes right mm-hmm. uh the risk is also higher and level of the competitions so we discuss with the patient if the patient accepts for the second uh, dislocation or third dislocation okay i let the patient judge i will not judge because it's not my shoulder is the patient shoulder we just give the information and the patient will judge that okay mukesh okay. ips yeah thank you yeah. exactly same as aji said just in addition that if i feel that patient is hyper lax or and if he's male rather than a female i would rather tell them more about surgery and try to explain it more about surgery so everyone so the opinion is everyone will agree that less than 20 years of age we should advise surgery for first time dislocators if we take only age as a criteria oh no i try to push yes, them yes. for me i tr- i try to push them for surgery because okay. i just feel that the progressive bone loss which happens with each dislocation is it's a disservice to them if they get bone loss mm-hmm. okay so my practice if i if advise the patient give information the patient will just to do surgery okay Tashis, you had some another opinion on this. No, no, I, I paused because age came into your argument later. Yeah, so if it's less than twenty. I completely endorse that. Absolutely. Okay, so that's the take home, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now okay. let's move on. Yeah. So uh, we move to the next talk by Dr. Bancha. Uh, Dr. Bancha has been to Nagpur many times. We have interacted a lot, and we feel he is more Indian to us than Thai. So, thank you, Dr. Bancha, for uh, accepting the invite, and please uh, go ahead with your talk. Yeah, next time you give me the green card for Indian. Yeah, I will be <laughs> Indian. <laughs> so, thank you, the Indian Arthroscopy Society, for the kind invitations. So, um, today I'm talking about the recurrent dislocation in hyperlaxity patients. Yeah, I think this is quite confusing when I was resident. Uh, yeah. because at that time my my teacher always talking about the mdi you should do it in conservative way right this is my medical student she came and asked me so prof what's wrong with my shoulder i can do this way yeah do i need to fix it i said oh this is the laxity you have some laxity is not your problem you just can you can can show that to your friends right but it's not the problem you have no pain right so this is the laxity 
So what is joint laxity? Joint laxity means this is increased length and elasticity of joint stretch con, uh, restraints. Get the degree of articular surface translation, right? And hyperlastic is not same like instability. Hypermobile joint is a ball on the wall with laxity in all directions, right? Like this guy, yeah, he can do that because this is a hyperlax joint, but it's not the problem, okay? So hyperlastic is asymptomatic hypermobile joint. We should not confuse with the MDI, right? Instability is a, is a symptomatic laxity. So it's totally different. So MDI is about 10% in all instabilities. Male is uh, less than female, okay? And most of the time the female is always good looking, beautiful, yeah. So we try not to touch her shoulder, right? So that can be congenital and can be acquired uh, joint laxity, okay? So that's classified into uh, three groups, yeah? So MDI is a symptomatic laxity in at least two directions, okay? Like inferior anterior, like the first scenario. This is inferior anterior, right? You have the sulcus positive, okay? And also the patient have the hyper abduction is painful, okay? And apprehension positive. This is the anterior inferior. The second scenario, this is the inferior posterior, okay? This patient have the uh, Kim positive. Yeah, Kim test positive. It's so much pain in the this position. So this is an inferior posterior, okay? Yeah. So another situation is the anterior, posterior and inferior. But important that you need to have inferior component, right? Like this patient have both symptoms in anterior and also the posterior, okay? So we can uh, look at this. Okay, so this is a Pagnani valence classifications about the MDI. So they classify into bond loose, torn loose, and acquired loose. Okay, the first group is the syndromic, the bond loose. This is like the congenital MDI. So the patient would have global instability in all directions, like earlier than loss, Marfan syndrome. This is a collagen problem. So the second group is the torn loose. Torn loose, the patient start with the asymptomatic laxity. And this kind of patient may have the active in sports. They have the repetitive injury or single injury. So finally, the lax capsule, lax tissue, would get label tear. So this is a torn loose, like I show you in the pictures, right? This is the hyperlax joint. You see the patulous capsule label recess. And one day the labrum start to be torn, right? So this patient will come with pain. And the last group is the acquired loose. So this kind of patient have the multidirectional laxities after repetitive microtrauma, like they are active in sports or head sports. And when you look in the intraoperative, you can see no label tear, okay? So these are the three groups, yeah, um, by Pagnani valent classification. I show you the first patient. This is type one, the true MDI, or we can call the syndromic MDI. This patient have congenital MDI, they have global instability, uh, subluxation, dislocation in all direction. The Bryson score weighs more than four, okay? So you look at this patient, they have a lot of scar tissue in the shoulder. She was operated many, many times, right? But she still can do the uh, subluxation of the joint, okay, after the surgery. So you look at her shoulder. This is both shoulder. She have the more than four or five times, yeah, every operation, a lot of anchors in the shoulder, also latache, but that cannot... Yeah, finally we did, um, they did a biopsy. They found that this patient is earlier than loss, okay? So every operation will be failed in her shoulder, okay? So don't touch this kind of patient. This is a syndromic true MDI. So the second group is the MDI, that is the MDL, multi-directional laxity with label tear. 
So this guy have the label chair, okay, from the arthroscopic uh, findings. So this start with the asymptomatic MDL, but after the repetitive or single macro trauma, they have capsule, uh, capsule laxity or redundancy with label chair, okay, like this, okay. So actually this guy, I, I met him six years ago. Yeah, at that time I'm taking care of the rugby team. So at that time had dislocation at the scene, but the mechanism of injury is not bad. So this young boy, okay, you see? This young boy, six years ago he had dislocation, but I treat him conservatively because I think that he has a MDI, is that just laxity. So he no, has no problem six years, uh, but until one day, uh, he has uh, so much pain and the dislocation become more. So finally, this MDI, okay, become MDI with label tear, okay? So I did the surgery for him. When I get in, I found that there's a patulous reset, you see that? And the label is torn, right? So uh, we do the surgery for him. We do the pan capsule label plastic like that. And he's quite happy of the surgery, okay? And the last group is the MD uh, type three. This is the acquired loose. So this kind of patient, they have the MDL with repetitive micro trauma, like swimmer, gymnast, racket, sports, basketball. So this kind of patient would have no uh, label tear, or they may have some label crack, right? So like this patient, you see that there's some label crack, like Kim lesion, but no obvious label tear, okay? So this is the type three, the acquired loose, okay? So important thing is that when you're uh, dealing with this type of patient, you need to see that this is voluntary dislocator or is involuntary. Look at, at this young girl, right? She has the involuntary dislocation, but her problem is the scapula, you see? Yeah, when I move, I uh, push her scapula back to the chest wall. So the subluxation is gone. Okay, so this is an involuntary dislocator. So I train her muscles and we make a scapula, a pillar scapula muscle training and she's become better after that. Okay, it's not dislocated anymore. So this is the importance of the pillar scapula muscles and the conservative treatment, right? So uh, the clinical size of MDI is a uh, difference in each patient. Some may, may came with the scapular thoracic problem Okay, they decrease the strength, they have numbness, thinking sensation, uh, dislocation in mid range, and sometimes the mechanism injury is really minor, is not appropriate. So if you have this kind of patient thinking about the MDI patients, and also uh, the bone loss in this patient is our very minimal. There'll be no heel sac, no bony bank cut in this kind of patient, right? So examination first, we need to make a good exposure to always see the scapula because many times the patient have the pelvic scapular muscles problem. Like this lady, she has wing scapula, check the cervical, uh, cervical spine every time and also the brachial plexus, okay? And let the patient show you how they can do that, okay? So assess the shoulder length of motions all the time, okay? And also check the... Uh, Yeah, some problem. Okay, Mukesh, I'm sorry. Some problem with the presentation. I will stop can, chat first. Unshare and then share it again. And then share again, right? Yeah. Because the file is really big, sorry. So if you have question, we can uh, have some questions now. Sorry, the file is so big because of a lot of videos. Regarding your acquired loose, yes. where you feel there is a no labral injury. Yeah. How you decide then when to intervene? Yeah. Or before intervening, what are your protocols of rehab and what other things you look into? 
Yeah, the acquired loans is the difficult problem. Is a uh, is the difficult to to decide to do surgery or not because if you do the MRI or MI arthrogram, mm -hmm. sometimes you didn't see any pathology. It's just a, a patulous or large capsule, right? So I will check the patients and try to uh, train conservatively the pelvic scapular muscles, slow the calf, everything, right? But some signs that that can tell you is that they, this is the instability patients or the indication for surgery after you train and conservative for at least six months to one year if the patient still have pain. So one side is really reliable is the painful jerk test. So when you do jerk, yeah, most of the time you have no pain. If you have pain, thinking about the conciliation like the Q 